Hey, y'all. I hope you all are doing well. Thanks so much for joining us today. As I said before, we have a very special guest with us, and he's right here, Mr. Adam Curran. How are you doing today, Adam? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me, Keith. Oh, man, it's such a pleasure to have you here. You know, we talked off camera before and just talked about the different nuances of what takes place here in South Carolina. And and we both really work almost in the same market, you know, people that are looking to retire to the state of South Carolina. And and you've written a book that really just addresses that and, and how they can kind of formulate their strategy going forward for retirement here in South Carolina. That's right. Yeah, we, we literally wrote the book on retiring in the state of South Carolina. And basically, the book talks about all the things that a South Carolinian retiree needs to get right in order to live an abundant retirement. And some of those topics are kind of catch-alls that you know everyone in the entire nation needs to get it right. But South Carolina in particular has a unique set of circumstances that I think present challenges and opportunities for people who are going to move down here and, and live their golden years in, in this wonderful state. So I'd love to go over each and every one of those topics. One of the one of the chapters in the book is on real estate, which you've probably forgotten more about real estate than I'll ever know. <laughs> well, um, I forget a lot of things like why I walked into the room, but um, <laughs> the book that, that Adam is talking about is called Retire Y'all. And I think you have a copy there, don't you? I do. Yeah. Put yeah, it right we'll, on the we'll, screen here. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll put that up on the screen too. And um, actually, Adam, that book, you don't charge anybody for that book. You're happy to give it to them. It's kind of a, an 80 page business card. Yeah. And, and our take is, and it sounds like you've got a similar thing with the content that you create. Um, just push out as much little nuggets of wisdom and knowledge as humanly possible, knowing darn well that not every single person who watches your YouTube videos or reads our book is going to decide to work with us. Um, but you know, um, if you can give them one little piece of, of information that lends itself to them living a slightly better retirement or lends itself to them buying a house in the right side of town or, uh, at the right price point, um, you know, our work is done and we know that we'll be rewarded in the long run by just giving people of ourselves as, as much as possible. So we do give the book away for free. It's part of our marketing budget. Uh, and whether you work with us or you, or you do it yourself or you work with your advisor, who's your golfing buddy, uh, we don't really give a rip. Just take us up on the free book offer and just do us a favor. If we send you a book, give it to a friend or family member who's also considering, uh, pulling the trigger and putting their two weeks notice in and, uh, hopefully down here in South Carolina. Although I don't know, you know, all of us damn Yankees as they're called, I'm sure you've, you've just described the <laughs> difference between a Yankee and a damn Yankee on your radio okay. show, you know, Yankees. Uh -huh come down here and just kind of eat shrimp and grits and play golf and go back home. But damn Yankees come down here and never leave. Um, you know, there, even though we've only been here, you mentioned 10 years and I've been 12. Don't you still yet kind of go, Oh, we don't want all these people retiring down here and ruining our wonderful state, even though we're part of the darn problem. Yeah. Yeah. We get blamed for that quite often, you know, the traffic and, you know, inventory of homes and things like that. That's always our fault. But you know something you mentioned, you mentioned something just a second ago, which was, you know, little nuggets of, of information. And, and there's something that caught my eye in your book when I was reading it that I just want to share right now with everyone, because so many people that I meet, they are in the process of moving here at some point. Okay. They may be three months away, six months away, a year away or more. And that's okay. And one of the discussions we always talk about is how they're going to finance their property here. And a lot of people will want to pay cash, which is, you know, totally a, a, an option. It's a good option. But this paragraph that, that you have in your book, let me just take a second and read it here. It's the key to good tax planning is always to be a step ahead of the IRS and the South Carolina Department of Revenue. Make sure you have multiple buckets of money with different taxes taxable statuses and look at your tax profile every year to be sure that you're converting as much money from qualified sources into more tax friendly buckets. This way you're better prepared to face an uncertain tax environment in the future. And to me that speaks volumes because like I was just saying a minute ago, people are coming here and they want to pay cash. They have money, but 
that is all they've got. And then they're, they're not looking at the bigger picture where they can put money into different buckets and they can generate income and it could be moved around. You explain that a little bit in your book on how you can do that. So when you hit certain thresholds, maybe it might be an age, maybe it might be um, a certain type of account, you can move that to minimize your tax burden. Yeah, the, the tax code is three times the size of the King James Bible. And if you read it at an average reading pace for one hour of a day, you wouldn't be even be able to read it in one year's time. And guess what they do at the end of the year? They change all the rules and change all the tax code on you. One thing that I hold out hope, though, is smart money people, smart tax people are always going to be a step or two ahead of the IRS. And the IRS is an acronym for IROB seniors because they prey on the complacent. Uh, and too many of us get our tax guidance by uh, going into our CPA or our tax preparer's office sometime around March or if you're a slacker, early April, and you drop all your stuff off on their desk. Uh, and at that season of their life, they are so overworked and underpaid and inundated. They're no longer in the business of strategizing and showing people how to avoid taxes. All they're doing is putting numbers in boxes. Uh, so it's almost like if you were to go uh, fight a battle, you know, do you want the guy who's, who's prepared and a specialist at, at, at avoiding fatalities and, and injuries, or do you want the person who's just really good at counting the dead and wounded? Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of our tax preparers, that's exactly what they're doing. Uh, you need to be strategic. You need to be forward thinking. And I, I think, you know, South Carolina in particular, uh, is a very, very tax friendly state for retirees. Just look at property taxes. It's probably one of the lowest property taxes in the entire nation. We've got tremendously low gas taxes. We don't tax your social security. We don't tax a lot of your uh, retirement benefits. Uh, and I think sometimes people are way too focused on the income tax, right? So you'll ask people, oh, well, Florida is a really tax-friendly state for retirees. Right. You go to Florida, look at your property tax in Florida. Look at your, uh, you got to pay money to cross bridges and ride on highways in Florida. So it's more than just the income tax. Uh, there's a lot of facets to, to tax code in general. And, and we like to pride ourselves on people who actually know how it works. We know all the little levers and, and hooks and things that you can, you, you can consider using to keep your tax bill low. It's a big thing. You know, we were talking off air. A lot of people you're speaking with are saying, I'm on a fixed income, right? And and I I, I I need to make sure my expenses are low. You know, if you actually quantify your expenses at the end of the year, you'll probably find one of the biggest pieces of the pie chart is your taxes that you're paying, whether it be through sales tax or property tax and um, income tax. So uh, it's a, it's a worthwhile pursuit. I think it was John Maynard Keynes who said the only intellectual pursuit pursuit worth anything is the avoidance of taxes, and we pride ourselves on that. Yeah. Well, speaking of Florida, the other revenue generator down there, of course, is the uh, traffic lights, the the stoplight cameras. <laughs> yeah, I, keep those out of South Carolina, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I I got a friendly bill from the folks down in Florida not too long ago telling me that. And you know, the amazing thing is they actually give you a link to a video. It's like, wow, you could see yourself going through the red light. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. But, you know, one of the things that, that I get questioned a lot about here, and I'm not a tax advisor, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not a, a, an accountant or a CPA or anything like that. And the best advice I can give you is to speak to your CPA or financial advisor, whoever it is. But when people, you know, when they come here and they do come down, especially after COVID with buckets of money. Okay. They've sold their house. They may have been living in for 20 years. It appreciated 40% in the last two years. They've gotten a lot of money and they're like, yeah, I want to like throw 50% down on my house or 75% down on my house. And we have this conversation because, you know, the, the question I have to ask is why? And, and the response I get more times than any is, well, you know, I want the lowest interest rate that I could possibly get. And I really need to have a conversation at that point with them that, you know, once you get to that 30% level of, of putting 30% down, your interest rate really doesn't improve. I don't care how good your credit score is. I don't care anything, you know, any, about anything else. That's about as low as it's going to get. The only thing it will do is lower your monthly payment because you will have a smaller mortgage. So, you know, when you can take your money and you can save it for your retirement, where it can be reinvested, 
you're gaining more money from that that you can actually use to live off of. And, you know, one of the things that, that you spoke about was, you know, that untimely death thing. OK. You, and also being the richest person in the graveyard, you really don't know when you're going to go meet your maker and you can be saving and scrimping and, 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 or maybe not doing anything at all. And all of a sudden, boom, you're done. Um, you don't know you're done, but you're done. And, you know, maybe you have some family members that are left over and now they need to take a, take over what you have kind of set up for them on the financial side of life. Yeah, you, you you touched on a couple of things there. One is the, the the mortgage conundrum, and I've got kind of a unique take on this. And um, you know, mortgages kind of have a qualitative and a quantitative element to them. You know, quantitatively, right now, there's many people who have mortgage notes that are only costing them, you know, three to four percent, and the risk free rate with investments is over five percent. So you you literally because what's happened with interest rates over the last six months or so, you can literally beat the banks with risk-free rates. Um, But there's an element, and I get it. I I get this, and it it might not make mathematical sense, but it makes all the sense in the world because with retirement planning, um, you know, there's something to be said about having a clear conscious and being lean and mean and not having any mortgage debt hanging over your head. And uh, to each their own, to a certain degree, I used to be big time, like a Dave Ramsey type zealot of, you know, pay, throw all your cash money at your house and pay your mortgage off. Um, But now with where where we see interest rates at, it just doesn't make a a ton of sense. But uh, not a day passes where we don't sit down with a with a retiree and um, we start gaming out their retirement and the elephant in the room is it could be husband wife and and the husband is 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 heck bent on paying the mortgage off uh and he doesn't care about the mathematics surrounding what the risk free rate is and what his yield on his mortgage are and and, and that's just a, a goal and a dream and something uh an itch that he needs to scratch and look to each their own you know my own wife you know the the, the book says uh, emergency fund needs to be 3 to 6 months um and my wife needs a heck of a lot more than that in, in cash reserves uh, to sleep well at night. And I'd say the same <laughs> thing about a mortgage. One more piece of food for thought as you talk about tax code, though. Most people have not been getting, and this could be one of the reasons why people are so eager to, to pay their mortgage off too, Keith. People have not been getting a mortgage interest rate deduction on their taxes mm-hmm. uh, since Trump's tax reform. Well, Trump's tax reform subsets in 2024. So when that happens, most people believe we will go back to where we were prior to Trump's tax reform, meaning the standardized deduction will drop to $12,000. So you'll begin receiving a tax break for what are called SALT taxes, state and local taxes, Mm -hmm. as well as your mortgage interest. So now that mortgage interest becomes tax deductible. Um, so it's something to hear again, you're, you're peering out at the horizon, not just making a dis- decision purely on the, the, you know, the environment right this minute, but you're looking at what, uh, where the, mo- the needle could move in the next two, three years. So uh, with that in mind, carrying a little mortgage debt is it, not nearly as bad, um, not really as bad as some people might, might chalk it up to be. Yeah, that's you know, a really, really good point. And one of the other things when we're on a topic of real estate, which is, of course, one of my favorite topics. Um, you know, a lot of people, folks that want to come down here or they're planning for retirement, I see this more often than not. What they want to do is they want to get in the market now before things get more expensive. And that's true. You know, real estate here has appreciated, you know, just like everywhere else in the country over, you know, during that COVID period. But even before then, we saw a lot of appreciation and people want to get in the market now. So what they'll do is they'll come down and want to buy a rental property and then they'll turn around and want to do an Airbnb, VRBO, whatever it is with it to help pay for it while they can come down and use it for a couple of weeks out of the year. And I know you have a, a a position on this as well. Well, you know, you're the guy I would ask for advice on that front, but uh, what I tell people who are moving down here, right you were asking before, where, where do you live, Adam? And I said, Daniel Island. Are you, you're in Johns Island or are you up in uh, Mount Pleasant? Mount, Mount Pleasant. Pleasant. Okay. Got it. You've, 
you get this. Like literally, the temperature and tone and the feel of John's Island compared to James Island, compared to West Ashley, compared to the peninsula, compared to Mount Pleasant, compared to Somerville, North Charleston, Daniel Island. It's like a completely different world. You cross one bridge, you got a completely different vibe. Couple that with one hour north of us is Pauly's Island in Georgetown in the, the South Grand Strand of Myrtle Beach. Hour and a half south of us, you're in Beaufort, in Bluffton, in Hilton Head, in Savannah. Every one of these places has a completely different feel, even though they're separated by a bridge or an hour on uh, Route 17. It has a completely different vibe and feel. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my parents as an example, right? So my parents, as soon as they caught a glimpse of their first grandbaby, um, they said, I, I, I'm got to be here. I got to be near this little thing. It, it's just completely got me wrapped around uh, his little finger. So they rented a Airbnb or a VRBO on Sullivan's Island. Well, you and I know Sullivan's Island. My mom was a professional clown growing up. My dad was a mechanical engineer, never made for than, more than $60,000 a year. It was a little outside their price point over on Sullivan's Island, but they had an opportunity to rent there. And by renting there for two or three months, they became tourists of Charleston real estate, right? So they, they toured uh, Shadow Moss in, in, in West Ashley. They toured Del Webb up in Somerville. They toured some condos down near Folly Beach. They got a good hard look at Mount Pleasant and some different neighborhoods in, in Mount Pleasant. Ultimately, where they wound up was Pauly's Island. So I, I would, I know this might fly in the face of you, you conducting a real estate transaction. And the mere fact that you said that, Keith, tells me that your heart is in the right place. You want your buyers to buy right, not just transact a, a piece of business that they grow to regret. But as small as South Carolina is, and I think people from New York and Connecticut think, you know, you come down here, everyone says y'all and eats grits and everyone's the same. <laughs> Not even close, right? I, I always kid that people who live in Myrtle Beach, and, and here again, people who live in Conway and people who live in uh, Calabash are completely different than people who live in Myrtle's Inlet and Pauly's Island. It, so, but, but the north side, uh, Myrtle Beach folks, I feel like there's a lot of Yankees who have no interest in acclimating to the South and saying, y'all, they just want to golf and live in warm weather and not shovel snow. You go down here to South Carolina, or excuse me, South Carolina, Charleston, you have more transplants that are charmed by the Southern way of living. Uh, you know, they want to go to the oyster rows. They want to make their own pimento cheese, what have you. They like saying y'all. Uh, and then you go down to, to the Hilton Head area, and it's kind of a little bit of combination of both. You get, and of course, I'm being tremendously stereotypical, um, but I don't even know how I got started on this. My recommendation is get a feel for all these different islands and all these different areas because they are very, very different, and there's different groups of people in these areas. Don't just uh, go online and read an article by Condé Nast saying, I want to live in Charleston. And then next thing you know, you're on the wrong side of town or on the wrong side of a bridge. Um, it, it, it's a it's a very nuanced place to live. It's a wonderful place to live, um, but certainly no different than any other community. There's a very different feels to different parts of town. No, you're, you're absolutely correct. And, you know, when you talk about you know, the different locations and, and, and the different vibes that you get everywhere. I mean, that's part of the edification process for so many people that come here. People, as we talked about off camera before, people become somewhat infatuated by the idea. They, they, they romanticize living in South Carolina or Charleston or one of these other, you know, places you just mentioned, you know, whether it's Hilton Head or whether it's Greenville or, or wherever it happens to be. And, you know, kind of a reality takes over at that point because there is an adjustment from where you're coming from to here. Yes, the cost of living is different. It's definitely lower. Taxes are definitely lower. There are a lot of benefits to that. But it's the charm that really what I see brings most people in. And when they go ahead and they, they want to get in the game, 
Um, they want to purchase now for a future event, them moving here, retiring here. It's not a bad strategy to do that, to, to purchase something and, and do that. But you have to be very, very, very aware of all the different rules and regulations that govern these Airbnbs and the and VRBOs, because each municipality, not city, but municipality actually will regulate how you can do it. As a and fact, the property the tax, app- mind you, as you know, you know, a rental property or an investment property. Uh, I just mentioned South Carolina has some of the lowest property taxes in the entire nation. It's about, works out to about a half a percent of your home's value uh, if it's your primary residence. Um, but if it's a rental property or an investment property, it is not cheap. It's double what you would typically pay uh, for your primary residence. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And, and basically what I tell people, it's, you know, it goes from 4% to 6%, but that's on paper. What they don't tell you is that you lose those credits in the municipality for things like the school and the fire department and the police department, which really almost gives you an effective rate of almost 10%. Okay. So mm-hmm. you really need to be conscious uh, of you know, all of that stuff. And there's some strategies that you can use. Again, I'm not an accountant or an attorney, but I can tell you what I've witnessed through my clients throughout the years that are purchasing property here and how they will put properties into different entities and, and do things like that, that minimize the overall cost, because at the end of the day, it may come out of their uh, taxable income. But let's swing back because we're, we're getting deep into the real estate stuff here. I want to really talk more about the, the benefits that, that you see when people are moving to South Carolina, regardless of what city it may be. Yes, we talked about the lowest you know, property taxes, and, and that really depends on the county, too, because they all change. But the other benefits that, that people can enjoy while they're, they're moving here to South Carolina, once they're here in South Carolina. Well, we, t- we touched on, on some of the biggest ones, and that is just you, you mentioned, you know, there's something charming about saying Charleston. It just kind of rolls off your tongue. And I think some of these people still uh, re- remember the movie Casablanca and everything. So, uh, you know, um, main drivers are going to be access to culture and entertainment. Um, I think one of the biggest reasons why we're seeing a major influx, I think it's 50 people per day are moving to South Carolina and two thirds of them are over the age of 50. I think one of the big reasons surrounding that is Charleston has become kind of a boom town for millennial yuppies, right? There's more job opportunities down here. People are calling the Charleston Harbor Silicon Harbor right. because of all of the technology startups that are getting started. We've got Boeing and Volvo uh, and BMW, bigger Fortune 500 employers are coming down here and go figure, um, you know, young people who need well, good paying jobs are following those big employers. Those young people are making babies and then go figure how quickly their grandparents, grandma and grandpa see, get a glimpse of that baby. No different than what happened with my mom and dad. And they go, boy, what the heck am I doing shoveling snow up here in the Northeast? There's nothing for me here anymore. I also think there's an element that people think of Florida like it's, uh, you know, purgatory. It's heaven's waiting room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they watch their parents pass away there uh, and they just don't want to, you know, feel that same. And not 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 to say people aren't retiring in Florida. They're retiring there in, in droves. But South Carolina all of a sudden starts to look a little bit more attractive for those two reasons. So certainly the charm uh, culture. We've got some of the best restaurants in the entire. We're spoiled almost, Keith. Like when I oh, go no. out to eat in other cities, I'm like. This is terrible. Like the 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 <laughs> standard, the bar of our cuisine here is set so high uh, that it almost ruins eating out in other cities. Um, and of course, we've got kind of all of the um, you know cultural things that come with the peninsula. There's constantly every single month. There's a different. Um, you've got seaweed and uh spoleto there's always some sort of thing going on if, if yeah, second type, sundays you've got second sundays there's always live music there's, there's a mm. show to take in um so we, we we check all of those boxes uh and then you've got the plantations if you're a golfer so the best golf in the entire world is here I, I could just carry on and on and on there's so many ways to keep yourself entertained here uh you're close to the beach you can 
jump in a car for two hours. You could be up in the mountains hiking. It, it, it really geographically just checks all the boxes. Um, yeah. Taxes are another one. People want to make sure they're not going to overpay in taxes. And just like I said, I think South Carolina is one of the most tax friendly states in the entire nation. Uh, another big one is health care. And health care, uh, if you I think Wallet Hub did a study and they said that South Carolina was one of the worst states in the entire nation for medical outcomes. Uh, and that factors in life expectancy and obesity statistics. You and me both know that if you go inland in South Carolina, there are some communities in some areas that probably skew that data. Uh, we've got MUSC right here, right here in Charleston. People travel from all across the South to seek treatment at MUSC. It's one of the best medical facilities on the face of the earth. Uh, and then I'd also argue to say that, you know, these very same people who want to get a taste of, of the South and live in Charleston, South Carolina, some of them are highly trained and wonderful doctors. So I, I think the medical care, um, equation that might get a bad, bad name with some, you know, wallet hub studies and such, uh, the tide is changing there. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're in a coastal community, you can get some of the best medical care and medical attention, uh, in the entire nation. I think as you go inland in some of the areas, um, what do they call it? The corridor of shame and some of the areas that, that have been almost forgotten in the path of, of progress and development, um, might not be getting the best care out there. But look, a rising tide lifts all ships. As the medical care in Charleston and Myrtle Beach and Hilton Head improves and Savannah improves, um, you know, that's going to ultimately bleed into the, the areas that are a little bit more inland. So, um, you know, I will say this, though. I will say this, right? And you've bore witness to this being in the real estate industry for, for two, two plus decades. South Carolina used to used to, I'm talking 10 years ago, be a haven to buy real estate cheap. Right. I don't think that equation exists anymore. We're not like a bargain discount residential market anymore. Right. Yeah. Now, when I first got here, which was 10 years ago, I remember going to the beach and looking at the beautiful beach homes there on the Isle of Palms. And I did a little bit of research and I'm like, you can buy that house for $700,000. I mean, I came from Southwest Florida, from Naples, where a house like that on the beach is going for a couple of million dollars. So yeah. to me, you know, I had that aha moment. I'm like, I need to buy real estate here in South Carolina because it's cheap right now. And will it ever go up? I have been, you know, through these cycles before. Yes, it definitely is going to go up. Now, you mentioned two different things that I want to talk about real quick. Wallet Hub. They're one of my favorite sources for information. And I actually did a video not too long ago. Well, I did one for last year and and um, I didn't do it again this year. But Wallet Hub actually has named Charleston as the best city to retire in for now two years in a row. Oh, okay. is that right? Two, yes, yeah, the best country, best city in the country to retire. I wish in. I gotta tell you, I want to shake the hand with the person who does the PR for the city of Charleston proper because. I think Condé Nast had it as like the number one little city in the world, not just in America, in the world yeah. for like 11 years in a row. Yeah. And I, whoever's palm they're greasing, they're doing a wonderful job <laughs> of it. But I mean, it, it, let's just say that there's no, you know, behind the scenes uh, backroom dealing going on here. I, I can't agree with them more. Right. Like, so I, I bounced around the country. I grew up in Connecticut, lived in Philly during college, lived in Park City, Utah, um, and the reason I landed on Charleston, cause it, it, it had a, a vibe comparable to the best parts of all those different places, right? Yeah. You have your history, like you do in Philly. If you want to walk down a cobblestone street and feel like you're walking around colonial America, you could do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has this small town, you know, kind of city feel like I felt out in park city, Utah. So, um, it, you know, that was well-earned. Yeah, I kind of you know, secretly, I, I, like we started the podcast off or started the video off with, I kind of secretly hope we would stop winning all of these accolades and awards so uh, we can fly under the radar for a few years. 
No, absolutely. And, and, and travel and leisure magazine, the same thing they've been, you know, and it's the readers, not the magazine. They've been doing polls and, and the polls have reflected in the last, I think, nine years straight. It's getting embarrassing, frankly, that Charleston is the number one place to visit. OK, so that's that's a little bit different. This is off topic. And, and I don't know why I'm going to bring this up, but I have like no filter. <laughs> okay. So one of the things that I was so charmed about Charleston um most places in this country, certainly in the Northeast, New York, Philly, big cities, the first question that a stranger will ask of you, guess what people ask of you up there? Like when you meet someone at a cocktail party. What do you, what do, you do for work? What do you do? Yeah. Have you noticed down here that that is not an individual's identity? Like I, I, I've, I've hung out with individuals for like months on end. I couldn't tell you what they do professionally. Right. I can tell you that they're a good, you know, family man. And uh, I can tell you they like playing basketball and they like, you know, surfing. And um, but I couldn't tell you what they do professionally. It's tremendously refreshing. It's tremendously refreshing. That was one of the things that I really, really loved about this place. You know, it's funny that you bring that up because, you know, when I first meet clients that, that are coming in from out of state and I had basically the same conversation with them, you know, you might go to a social event, okay, a gathering, it may be an oyster roast, it may be a cocktail party. And what I hear more often than not is not what is it that you do, the question, but the question is, what kind of boat do you have? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. And there's more boats per capita here than I think most of the, the rest of the country. But, you know, that's that's a big pastime here. People are always wanting to fish. They want to go, you know, to the islands. And that's something that if you haven't done, you know, when you come here, is that we have barrier islands that, yes, you can get to by cars, but there's also some that you can only get to by boat. And those are fantastic. When you do that, you can pull your boat up there, you anchor, and, you know, sit there and have a nice cool drink and enjoy lunch. And it's a fabulous thing. If you want to know more about that, let me know. But one thing I do want to touch on, because I know we're, we're getting a little bit short on time, because you mentioned this a couple of times now. You talked about your parents coming here and, and renting the VRBO. Um, a lot of times, okay. And, and I actually have a website and I'll tell you what the name of it is in just a minute. But when people move to places like Florida, especially now I was a broker down there. I had a, uh, a brokerage there and I also had one simultaneously up in Blue Ridge, Georgia. And that was very strategic because what I found was happening where people were coming down, they wanted to retire in Florida and it's the two of them. And they want to buy a 6,000 square foot house. And I scratch my head and I, I have to ask the question, why do you want to buy a 6,000 square foot house? It's two of you and you're retired. Well, because Bobby's going to be coming down with the kids and then Susie's going to be coming down. We need to have enough room for everybody. So when they get here, you know, everyone has, you know, their space and they can spread out and they can go swimming and everything else. I'm like, well, far be it for me to tell you how to spend your money. If that's what you like, let's go ahead and do that. So they do. Two to three years later, maybe four, I'll get a phone call. Hey, Keith, can you sell this sucker? I'm like, <laughs> why? And they're like, well, because Bobby doesn't come down and visit us anymore. Yeah. And Susie, she got a job in California and they don't want to come visit grandma and grandpa all the time. So I was like, okay, sure. I could sell it. Where are you going? And they're like, well, we really don't know. I'm like, Okay, well, how about Blue Ridge, Georgia? And they're like, hmm, that's an idea. You know, that, the mountains, it seems cool during the summers. And well, we'll be halfway back to where we came from. So it's easier to get to them and go visit without living in the same town. So, yeah. yes, my website's called halfbackers.com. Yeah, so many a I, there's a name for that. Yeah. And I think that's probably another reason South Carolina is on the map, perhaps. So we get so many people coming from Florida, okay, where they went to retire initially in, in Florida. And then they discovered, well, it's too hot. It's too expensive. The kids don't want to visit us. They don't want to go, go to Disney World each and every time they come down here. 
they want, you know, someplace different. They want to come and they heard about Charleston, which we have a temperate climate. Actually, today, you know, we woke up in the 40s. That's a big difference from Florida, where I know, because I have a sister down there. I spoke to her this morning and they're in the 70s. And then if that's what you want year round, that's OK. But a lot of people, not only do they want the, the change of climate, they want to be more uh, engaged. Okay. More yeah, active. I, and there's so many things here, like you mentioned before to do, you know, it, even if it was just going to restaurants, you could never eat your way through all the restaurants here. Well, you t- two things. One, well, my sister's down in Western Florida. Yeah. And around Christmas time, it doesn't feel like Christmas when it's 80 degrees out, but um, there's something to be said about if you build it, they will come. Right. So um, I know one of the key things, a lot of retirees, they want to be a part of their grandkids' lives. And they have this utopian dream to build, buy the big old house. That way there's a room for everyone to sleep in. But look, your grandkids are living their own life. They're not going to come live in your basement uh, or live in your, your, your guest room um, you know, once a month. But I will say this. Every now and again, I'll have a client and they'll go, boy, my grandkids never, you know, they never visit me. And it turns out they live in the middle of nowhere with no nightlife, no culture, nothing enjoyable. So if you build it, they will come, right? So if, if you've got it within your budget and you want your children and your grandkids to be a bigger part of your life, funny thing about beach houses, they have a knack for luring people to them. <laughs> funny thing about houses with docks and boats. Funny thing about living near the peninsula so you could jump in an Uber and get down to the nicest restaurants in the entire world in five minutes. So if you build it, they will come. Uh, I think that's an important thing. If you want to be a part of your kids and your grandkids' lives, you need to situate yourself in an area that you love, of course, because they're not going to be a part of your life that much. But if you build this awesome emerald castle on the hill, uh, people will be a little more prone to visit you. No, absolutely. And I always give this warning to folks that are doing exactly what you just mentioned. I tell them, don't make it too nice because then they won't leave. That's right. Okay. Eaglets. <laughs> eaglets put thorns in their nest and they push the little eaglets out of the nest. That way they don't get too comfortable. Exactly. Exactly. Well, listen, we need to wrap things up here today, but Adam, I definitely want to get back and have another conversation with you. you you've got so much knowledge and, and so much apparent talent in this as well that, you know, I think you would be um, a fantastic resource for people that I deal with on a regular basis. That is people that are retiring or thinking about retiring here to South Carolina. Absolutely. Well, like, like you said at the beginning, please, by all means, take us up on this little book offer. Uh, you can reach out to Keith's team or our team. Our website's retireyall.com, retireyall.com, which is a term you got to get comfortable saying when you move down here. Usually people start by saying you all, and then it slowly just draws into y'all in short order. <laughs> uh, but go to retireyall.com, get our book or reach out to Keith's people. And we're happy to give the book out. Um, and I think it does a pretty good job of covering similar to our conversation, but maybe in a little bit more detail on some of the nerdy, geeky finance stuff, uh, the things you need to get right in order to live an abundant retirement down here in South Carolina. And come on down. I was kidding about the whole Yankees, damn Yankees thing. Um, let me let me end with one thing, Keith. Um, before I moved here, I thought because I grew up in Connecticut, school in Philly, I thought the only people that were going to hire my little rinky dink financial planning company were going to be fellow fast talking Yankees, right? Because I didn't speak with a drawl and I operated at a quicker pace. And I never thought the blue blooded Charlestonians and South Carolinians would, would hire me because I, I didn't speak Bubba to my surprise, my first year in business I was hired by nothing but native Charlestonians and native South Carolinians. And all of the, the fast talking city slicking Yankees would say things like, well, you haven't been in business down here very long. You know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to wait till you, you're a little more established. Right. Whereas these individuals with pluff mud in their blood and American by birth, but Southern by the grace of God mm-hmm. were hiring me based off of a handshake They wanted to know about my values. They wanted to know about my beliefs and they, they put a little trust in me. And that's something I will never, ever forget. And when I hear people, um, you know, kind of 
make fun of South Carolina, like, oh, they fly the Confederate Confederate flag down there, even though you know that that's not true. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or they 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 call us unenlightened Southerners Mm -hmm. and such. I very quickly defend her because uh, the natives here, with all the development that's happened around them, have such a tremendous attitude maybe they talk about us behind our backs but from my from my vantage point they get it they go look how wonderful it is here it was only a matter of time before more people found out about it and it was Mm -hmm. only a matter of time before it started getting to develop the way it was so uh some of those misnomer misnomers about south carolina being very blue-blooded and you know a good old boy network uh i'm living proof this State has taken me with open arms and it's allowed me uh, to take my little business from a three in one printer and a laptop to now, you know, offices all across the coast and tons of employees and tons of clients. So uh, I love this state and uh, God bless South Carolina. God bless America. (laughs) There you go. That's fantastic. Now, if you would like to get Adam's book, you can also get it right along with my relocation guide. Okay. And I talk about not only Charleston, but the entire low country. So if you want to get that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link in the description below this video. All you have to do is click on it. Just give me your name and your email address. So we know where to send it to, and it will appear magically in your inbox for you. Of course, if you have any questions in the meantime, you could reach out to me as well, or Adam, um, I'm going to put his, his contact information in the description as well. Adam, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure. We have to do this again without a doubt. And the only thing I guess I could probably say right now is bye, y'all. Yes. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate it.